Today's daf we're going to be learning is Sota, daf Kavchet. Our learning today will be in honor of the State of Israel celebrating 75 years of independence. This month's learning is sponsored by Bracha Ratner in memory of Anne Ratner on her sixth year at Side, a woman who was curious about the world and a role model for her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren with her dedication to Torah and to Israel. We miss her more every year. This week's learning is sponsored by Terry Kervosha for a and a good outcome for her husband, Chaim ben Sipora Riva, on his surgery today. Today's app is sponsored by Belinda Crakey in memory of Jeffrey Rhodes, 54th year at site, husband to Madeline, father of Belinda Jane, died too young in 1969 to see the legacy of his grandchildren, Jonah, Noah, and Dahlia Crakey. Today's app is sponsored by Laura Schechter in honor of her daughter, Kayla. Batzlacha to all the contestants competing today in the Chidon Tanakh, most especially to Kayla. The learning we've done together as a family because of your commitment has brought us all so much joy. Kayla, you're our champion. Always mazal to Okay, a lot of things to talk about today. We will get started now with going back to our Mishnah. I want to point out one small, very minor um, correction, how I read it yesterday. It was something I read that I was thinking as I read it, something here doesn't make sense. And I checked it after class and I realized, in fact, I read it a bit incorrectly. So I'm going to go back and start with that. We started in the Mishnah with, and this will be good background to what we're going to do today, what we're going to start with. We started with Kashem Shahamayim Botkim Ota, Kahamayim Botkin Oto. Just like the waters check her, the waters check him. Notice the language is him, doesn't really say who the him is. And that's what the Gemara is going to get into. We already explained yesterday, we're talking about the man that she committed adultery with, but he's going to die just as she dies. But the Gemara is actually going to question and say it just says him, maybe it means the husband. Um, where do we get it from? Uvau, Uvau, because it says Uvau, Uvau two times. Today we're going to see a bit of an adjustment to that statement, that it's from the two times it says uvau. Um, then the Mishnah says, Kishem labal, the second halacha is, just like she's, once she's suspected of being a sota, she will not only be forbidden to her husband, she'll also be forbidden to be with the adulterer, right? The person she committed adultery with. How do we get that? which I already told you we're going to see later, that he's darshaning the fact that it says as the vav, and it says nitma. In other words, it could have just said nitma because the Pasuk says, right, which means she is defiled or she is impure. So the word is vinitma and, and Rabbi Kibo is darshans every little thing, and means two things you can learn from here. Not only is she forbidden to her husband, she's also forbidden to the adulterer. Here's the line I want to correct my reading of. That statement is going back to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yoshua comes and says the same way Rabbi Akiva said it, that's how Zachariah ben Akatsav also understood it, by his drasha, as opposed to that being the introduction to the next line, which was my mistake. Then Rebbe comes, and the reason I realized it was a mistake and why something didn't jive when I was saying is because Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Akiva come before Rebbe. So it doesn't make sense that Rabbi Yeshua was saying, this is how Zechariah ben Akatsav said it and then said it like Rebbe. It, that was previously and that's a Rebbe was later. So that's all referring to Rabbi Akiva. Then we have a new thing, which is that Rebbe disagrees and Rebbe Omer, Shnei Pami Mamurim B'Parashan, Nitma'a V'Nitma'a Chalabal V'Chalabal. And then Rebbe says, no, it's because it says it two times in the Pasuk and that's where we get it from. So the mistake I made was not, a, it didn't make any difference in terms of the, the content. It was just a matter of, who does Zechariah ben Akatsav agree with? It turns out he, what he was really saying it to support Rabbi Akiva, not to go against Rabbi Akiva. And then Rebbe is the one who ends up disagreeing with Rabbi Akiva. Starting from Kapsayin Amabed at the bottom now. Oto Leman. Who is this Oto who is going to die alongside the woman? So the woman drinks the Sota waters. At the same time, wherever he is, he is going to die. He who? Well, Ilema Labal, if you're going to say the husband, Baal Mayavid. What did the husband do wrong? His wife committed adultery. Who, why is the husband to blame? Now, you might remember in the beginning of the Masechet, what did we say? And you can see why they even thought, because you would say, of course it can't be the husband. What logic would that have? Well, if you remember in the beginning of the Masechet, the rabbis kind of said, well, no woman commits adultery without there being some sort of problem of the husband, right? And, and there must be some problem with the relationship, you know, and maybe he did something wrong. So maybe that's what they were thinking. However, Number one, what did he do wrong? The chitemen, if you want to say, well, maybe what it's saying is if she committed adultery, because maybe he committed adultery or 
he did something wrong in the relationship and he's to blame as well. And maybe what it's saying is if he did, and it's not that he did something wrong, but if he did something wrong, he would die at the same time, and which there's logic to it, right? He accuses his wife and it's kind of, here, here's where we get to the, what we call the Shivyoni Sugya. It's the Sugya where we all of a sudden, right? If you think this whole thing and the Sota is all shifted toward the woman and blaming the woman for everything, just like we saw in the beginning of the Masech they started pushing, push back in the other direction saying, oh, the man is equally to blame. Um, even though, right, according to the Torah, he doesn't play any real role in this. Well, they're going to say, if you're going to say, maybe he dies as well. If you coming, if a man comes and accuses his wife of sleeping around when he himself had been sleeping around, maybe when she drinks the water, it checks him as well. And he dies at the same time. Well, that can't work. Why? On a technicality. Okay. And it's theoretically that would work, but there's a technical problem. What's the technical problem? This would all assume that the waters are killing her and therefore they'll kill him as well. Well, there's a basic law and here they're going to find a source for finding some equality here in the Torah, which is what? If he has some sort of sin upon him, and we don't know what kind of sin this is. Hey, Gefet's topic this week is what are all the different opinions about what iniquity is in his hands? Hey, what sin are we talking about? Okay, is it that he committed adultery? Is it, according the Ramam goes even so far as to say, even if he did something that's only rabbinic in sinning in some sort of um, inappropriate relation. Or according to the, the Rashi, it's very limited. It's if he slept with his wife after accusing her of being a sota, right? Remember, after he accuses her and she's in the room alone with the man, he's not allowed to be with her. That's why we have the Tamidei Chachamim. And if he sleeps with her at that point, the waters won't check him. So maybe it's just that Avon. Anyway, there's all discussion. You can listen to Rabbi Yel Shimon Ushi or in Gethet, all going into the details about what exactly are we blaming the man for? What Avon is in his hands that we're relating to? Anyway, the law is the following. If he has, and this is a very interesting law, and they're going to learn it from the Torah, so which basically puts some equality into the, the Sota ceremony in the Torah, when he has an Avon Bedide, if he has sinned, okay, again, we're not sure exactly in what way, but he's sinned in some way having to do with inappropriate relations. The waters no longer work. It can't work. In other words, this whole Sota ceremony, which is meant to prove, is she innocent or guilty? If he has a sin, the whole ceremony just doesn't work. And which maybe, again, if you talk about why there never was a Sota, it could also explain why there are already limited how many, right? Already, number one, the man has to air it all out in public, which probably he doesn't want to do. Number two, he has to be free of sin as well. Now, again, it doesn't mean free of any sin. We all do some sins, but it means free of sins in this realm, in this area of, you know, sexual, you know, licentious behavior and all that. So again, depending on how you understand it. But once we do that, again, if she's involved, it's possible he's involved, not necessarily, but it's possible. It already limits even more so the types of cases where we can have the soto water working. Now, how do we know this? The Hatanya, it says in a Braita, Vinika Haish Meavon, Tisat Avona. This is a puzzle at the very end of the section, which says the man is free of sin and the woman will bear the sin. Okay, will bear the iniquity. So what do you see here? In order for the ceremony to work, it has to be that he is free from sin. Okay. And she will bear the, the sin. But but if he's not, why did he have to say, he will be cleansed from sin? What sin? So it's basically saying only if he's clean from sin and doesn't have any sin in his hands, then he then she will bear the sin and she will die. But the waters won't work to check her. If he's not, okay? So, if he's not free from sin, it's a fascinating halacha. And again, for all of us who are always seeking to find ways where there's equality here, it's taking a ceremony that really focuses on the woman exclusively as if she's the only one to blame. And as we saw already in the beginning of the Masechet, and in fact, Rabbi El Shimoni says at the beginning of her shiur, you, know, you would have hoped this would have come up in the beginning of the Masechet. Not sure why it only comes up now, although it does come up somewhat in the beginning of the Masechet in those comments of the rabbis about if someone's doing this, probably their husband is someone to blame for this. Then 
this is also stressing that element, which is not all, going even farther to say, if he's got something wrong in his hands, right? You can't start pointing fingers. And this isn't just about equality, male, female, but it's about anyone accusing someone else of something. Don't accuse someone of something that you yourself are a part of, right? And that basically means this whole thing won't work. And in order for this to work, the man has to be kind of perfect. And the woman is the one who has created the problems and then it will work. But otherwise it doesn't work at all. Now, Ella Liboel. So now we get back to if it's not him dying, because again, it's he won't die because of a technicality. Maybe he'd be, maybe there's sin. Okay, either there's no sin in his hands, in which case obviously he's not dying. If there is sin in his hands, well, he won't die because she won't die. The whole thing here is when she dies, he'll die. She won't die because there is no such thing. If he's sinned, he can't bring her and accuse her when he's to blame or when he has his own blame on his hands. So therefore, it must be Ella la boel. So who's the oto? There's always a problem when you use pronouns. The Mishnah used a pronoun here. Hamayim botkim oto, they check him. Now notice something weird in the language of the Mishnah. The Mishnah starts off and says, just like the waters check her, they check him. Then it says, just like she's forbidden to her husband, and no pronouns there, she, likewise, she's asula la boel. She's also forbidden to the one she committed adultery with, or is suspected of committing adultery with. So there it says, no pronouns used, Baal and Boel. So the Gemara says, if you're going to say it's la Boel, it's to the one she is suspected of committing adultery with, it should have said it explicitly like it says it at the next line. And there, they don't call it him, they say the Boel. So why don't they say the Boel in the first line as well? To which they say, don't ask that kind of question. Lo'olam, the Boel, it's really talking about the, the Boel, the one who she committed, potentially committed adultery with. Beresha, in this case, it would have to be the one who she definitely committed adultery with, because the point is he's going to die when she dies. Beresha, I did the Tana Oto, Tane Ota, Tane Oto. Because it said her, right, it says, just like the water checks her, because we knew exactly who she was, we're obviously talking about the Sota, the waters also check him. And that's why it's just matching the language. And Seifa, I did Tane Baal, Tane Boel. But in the second part, it said, just like she's forbidden to her husband, which she had to say, there was no other way to say it. Therefore, it said to her Boel. And therefore, in the first line, it just used a pronoun because with her, they used a the pronoun and therefore they continued with the pronoun. In the second part, they used the, the husband. Therefore, they used the, the adulterer. Okay, that's the first section for today. Now we're going to get to the source for this halakha. How do we know that the man dies? Shenema uvau uvau. So now the Gemara wants to know. Ibailu. They ask the following question. Bau uvau kama. O uvau uvau kama. When it says uvau uvau, do they mean bau uvau? The fact that the word says it with the plural, with the vav, just like the nitmu vinitmu. Or is it uvau uvau? Or does it look more like it says, and like we explained yesterday, uvau uvau, which means we're quoting two different verses. So is it one of the verses, one of the mentions of it, and it's said in the plural form. Is that how we're learning it? Or is it because uvau appears more than once? We're actually going to see it appears three times. Tashma. So let's learn from the continuation. Now notice the structure of the Mishnah. The Mishnah, the whole first part of the Mishnah seems to be Rabbi Akiva, two halachot. One is uvau uvau comes to teach you that just like the waters check her, they check him. The second Allah is just like she's forbidden to the husband, she's been forbidden to the adulterer from the word nitma vin nitma. So the Gemara says, ah, it's very obvious. Kishem, let's learn from the second line. Kishem sh'asura labal, kach asura laboel shenem al nitma vin nitma. So there you see. Now, what do you see? Well, we're not really sure what you see. Now, we already know, because I explained to you, the nitma vin nitma means the extra vav. So perhaps they're saying the extra vav, but we're not sure. So in other words, they're going to assume since it's Rabbi Akiva and he darshan the vav in vinitma, he probably darshan the vav in uvau, in which case we're only talking about one mention of the word and the fact that it has a vav, right? Remember, vav means end. But the Gemara says vadaim tibai, but still that's not so clear because nitma nitma kamar, oh nitma vinitma kamar. But we're still not sure. It's not clear what Rabbi Akiva says. We could ask the same question by Rabbi Akiva in the second halacha. When he says nitma vinitma, does he mean it appears twice nitma because all of these words that we keep quoting appear multiple times in the section. So is it the fact that it appears multiple times or is it the fact that it adds a vav to the beginning? To which they say, no, 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 it's obvious in the nitma what he means. 
Why? Because there's an opinion that disagrees with him. And let's see what the opinion that disagrees with him said. Tashmami the Katani Seifa, from the continuation, it says, Rebbe Omer, and Rebbe is very clear. Shnei pa'amim ha'amorim ba'parasha. Two times it appears in the text. And he's disagreeing with Rabbi Akiva. So I write, vinitma, vinitma. Echal labav, echal laboel. So since Rabbi, Rabbi, who's disagreeing with Rabbi Akiva, says we learn it from the two times it appears in the text, michlad Rabbi Akiva vave kadarish. From here, it's obvious that Rabbi Akiva's darshaning the vav. Okay? And that's our, and therefore, he'll kachli Rabbi. Okay, so now let's just stop for a minute. So that means uva'u. When it says uva'u, uva'u, it doesn't mean the way we thought yesterday. It's two different mentions of the, of the word uba'u in the psukim. It's really from one of the mentions and the fact that it's said in plural, that teaches you that whatever happens to her happens to him as well. So now the Gemara is going to point out that not only does the uva'u appear two times, it actually appears three times. And now according to Rabbi Kiva, it appears three times. And each time it has a vav, that's going to basically need to teach us six things because one thing with a vav teaches us two things. And then it appears three times. So two times three, we get to six. So that's what the Gemara says right now. Hilkach, le Rabbi Akiva, shita kray ktivu. So according to Rabbi Akiva, uvav appears basically six times. It appears three, but each time with a vav. So from there, we're going to see it's really like six. What are these six things coming to teach you? Each thing is going to be one for her and one for him. So the first is to teach the commandment, which we'll explain in a minute, one that she's commanded and one that he is commanded. The second is for the execution for her and for the execution, meaning the, the it happening, it coming into fruition. We'll talk about in a minute what these terms are very hard to understand. We'll go with Rashi's explanation. And the third time is to to explain to them properly. We'll see in a minute what needs to be explained properly. One for her, one for him. So remember what this uvao means. Uvao is talking about, and the waters, these bitter waters or the cursed waters are going to come into the body, right? And what will it do? Will cause the stomachs to explode and the and the thigh to fall or the reverse order. We had all that difference. So Rashi will start off shita cry, okay? And we're going to skip down to about two, three lines in Rashi. He actually talks about the last one first. The lahudia is to teach the yidia so that they know is what we actually had this in the beginning of the masechet. Lahudia lanu debetem v'hadar yarech shelo lahudzi la as it says on daf ten, which is what. If you remember, the order switches. Sometimes it says first the the thigh because remember that's where she sinned first, and then the stomach. And some say the stomach and then the thigh. So basically, if you remember what we said there is that the thigh is really cursed first because she sinned through her thighs. And then it went, you know, let's say the semen went into her stomach kind of thing or somewhere around there. But when it actually happens, she's actually going to get punished with her stomach first because the water goes down to her stomach and then her thigh. So they want you to know that even though the curse starts off that way, let's when, when it starts to happen and her stomach gets sick first, she'll say, oh. This isn't really what the soto waters were supposed to be, right? This isn't really, the soto waters aren't working properly. And that's what we call the hutzila. She'll start making mocking the soto waters. Since we don't want that to happen, we explain to her, we have to switch the order and talk about it a second time, right? Or an additional time, in this case, third time, to explain the order of events. So one of these times of uvau is just to teach you the order of how it's going to happen so that she doesn't mock the whole ceremony. And why is the vav there? So that when it happens to him, the adulterer, he won't mock the, or, the, the order of events. He'll mock the soto water. So that's the yidia. Now let's go back to the first one, sava'a. So Rashi says, I'm skipping down a few lines, lit sava'a. Shakadosh baruchu gozel sheyavo bahamayim lemarim. This is basically God's commandment that the waters are going to work. So we have a commandment. This is how it's going to happen. And it tells you, God says, this is how it's going to happen. The waters are going to come and do their thing. And and the, the other, the third explanation now is for the execution of it. To say not only, now again, you have to wonder why you need both a command and an execution, but one is saying the commandment that God does this kind of thing. And two is the execution of it. It's describing here's the execution of God's will and God's method of punishment. So that's why it appears three times. 
and with a vav to say there's a commandment that it's going to work for her and one that it's going to work for him. And there's a commandment that's going to be executed on her. There's a, a statement that's going to be executed on her and it's going to be executed on him. And that we have to teach them the proper order. So we add an additional one to say, this is how it's actually going to happen. One for her and one for him. That's how Rabbi Akiva Darshan says. Now, Rebbe, we already learned, doesn't darshan the vav. So for him, Rebbe, it's lot to cry ktiva. You really only have three times it says uvav because each one doesn't get doubled. So he agrees in theory with these three things. One is for the commandment, one is for the execution, and one is for knowing how it's going to happen. But what's missing? The Rebbe, where does he get? Now they assume that Rebbe agrees, okay, with the fact that the waters are going to check him as well. The question is though, where does he learn it from? He can't learn it from Uvau because Uvau, 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 the rep rep repetition of the Psukim is used for something else. So what is, where does he learn it from? Gemara is going to say, not Kalemi Ditanya. It's learned out from the following bright time. Let's bot beten the lampil yalech. Okay, if you remember, it says a few times about this stomach exploding, thigh falling. And we're basically, right, most of the times it says, bitna, her, with a hay, with a, with a, what's called a mapik, a dot in the hay, which means her stomach, her thigh. But in one of the places it says, let's bot beten the lampil yalech, that these waters are meant to explode the stomach, not her stomach, and, ex and fall make fall the thigh. So it said, first of all, in the masculine, because it doesn't have the feminine. So we're going to learn from here. This is a brighta, which we're going to say must be Rebbe, because he can't learn it from the vavs, because he doesn't darch in vavs, like we saw Vinitma, he doesn't say the vav. So we're going to say, it said in the, in the masculine form, to say we're talking about also his thigh falls, his stomach explodes. To which the bride continues, the classic structure of a midrash halacha, which you've already seen many, many times, which is they state the halacha and where you get it from, but then they start questioning, is that really so? Who's to say it's his and not hers? To which they say, well, it's obvious because when it says her stomach explodes, her thigh will fall. That's clearly talking about her. So why did they change the language? It's to teach you, but it must be talking about his. Now, we have to explain then, what about Rabbi Akiva who disagrees with him and doesn't learn it from here? The Edach, the other one, and we go to our ping pong. Who? What does he do with let's bot betem v'lampil yarech? Who de model a kohen de betem b'reisha v'hadar yarech? Oh, it's the teachers what we talked about before. That mention of it is mentioned in the place exactly where we said that's for the kohen to explain. This is the order. It's going to be first your stomach and then the thigh. Even though really you were cursed first in the thigh, then in the stomach. Shelo lo hutzilas alamayim amarim, so that they don't start mocking and saying this soda water doesn't do anything. It doesn't, right? It didn't go like you said it's going to go. So obviously, you know, don't, don't claim now. Obviously she's dying at that point, but still she'll mock the waters. And, and before you know, her last dying words will be, oh, look, this whole thing didn't work properly and make fun of God, basically. Well, the Edach, what's Rebbe going to do? Don't you need that also? So what's he going to say to that? And this is the classic, we can say based on how they worded it, you can theoretically learn two things. Again, it changed from the typical language. It should have said her stomach, her thigh. It, 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 but even if you're trying to say the orders changed, you should have kept the language the way it was until now, which is relating to her. My beten v'yarech. So Rebbe comes and says, again, this is putting words in Rebbe's mouth, but answering the questions for Rebbe. Why does it say it without that? Shema mina laboel. To which they answer, or they question, they say, or they, I meant more they respond to this and ask a question on Rebbe. But you know what? Maybe it really is all coming to teach you the order. How do you know it's coming to teach you both? In kein lichto bitno v'yirecho. Sorry, the opposite. Maybe it's coming only to teach you, my mistake. Maybe it's coming only to teach you about him. 
that he's going to die. And maybe it's not coming to teach you this thing about the order and worried that they're going to make fun. So they say, well, then it should have said, if they really wanted just to say it's the man, then just like they said, which means her stomach, her thigh, it should have said, his stomach, his thigh. The fact that they changed from, in other words, they changed number one and got rid of the ends of the hers. But the fact that they didn't change it directly to say his, and they changed it twice. They did two shifts. Number one, get rid of the whole that it belongs to somebody, right? And, but got rid of the feminine first, which meant it's talking about a male. And number two, though, but didn't make it totally parallel by saying his, from there, you can learn my bet and the From there, you can learn both. Let's come and teach you both these things. Again, number one, that it's talking about him, that he gets punished. Because remember, Rabbi Akiva learned it from the Ubau, from the Vav. Since he doesn't darshan Vavs, and he needs the three times as mentioned to teach you the other things, the Sivoy, the commandment, the Asiya, the execution, and the, um, the Yidia, that they understand the order, then we're going to need to explain where do you learn the fact that he's going to die? Oh, we learn it from Beten and Yerech. Okay, and the fact that it changed it from instead of saying bitnovi yerecho, we can learn two things. It's also talking about the order. Amar Rabbi Yeshua. Now we're moving on to the next section. right? He learned like Rabbi Akiva. And now we're going to get to the, this was all about the first line in the Mishnah, which was just like the water checks her, it also checks him. Okay, I'll do a quick summary right now. We won't do a summary at the end of this part. I'll summarize this part right now, which is number one, we said, who's the Oto? Who's the him who's going to die? Can't be the husband because if he was involved in either, he was innocent, in which case he shouldn't die. If he was guilty, well, then the waters would never work anyway. And then they won't work on him or on her. Then they won't work on him. And then we said it must be the husband. I'm sorry, the adulterer. Must be the adulterer. And then we said, where do we get it from? When Rabbi Kiva says, uva, uva, does he mean two mentions of the verse? No, he doesn't. He means the extra above, just like in the next section, which we're going to get to right now. And the, although we're going to see something a little different in Rabbi Akiva. And then we said, um, Rebbe, where does, if he says, and then we saw Uvau appears three times, in fact. So to Rabbi Akiva, that was six. What did we learn from there? The three things times two, which means each one we learned, we learned both for her and for him. Rebbe, who doesn't have the Vav, only learns them for her, but the same three things. So then the question becomes, where does he learn that the husband is guilty? And to which we answered, he gets it from the words, Beten and Yarech. And then we had a bit of a ping pong back and forth between him and Rabbi Akiva. And in the end, we proved how Rebbe could explain the Beten and Yarech are coming for both things. Okay, they're coming to teach you both the order so that nobody starts mocking the order of how it's actually going to happen. And it teaches about the husband and that because if it was just, I'm sorry, the adulterer. If it was just talking about the adulterer, it would have said Bitno V'yarecho. In fact, it says Beten V'yarech, we can learn and they made two changes from the other Psukim we can learn both things. Now we're going to bring a Brighta. Shalosh pa'amim hamurim atanu rabbanan. Here the Brighta says, Shalosh pa'amim hamurim ba'parasha. Im nitma'a, nitma'a, v'nitma'a lam. There's three places in the in the Torah where in the section of the Sota where it says the word nitma'a. One place it says, im nitma'a, that's in Pasuk 27. Yishka tamayim ba'ita, im nitma'a, if she's guilty. And Timol Baal Bishan, she really went against her husband. Then the waters will come and they will cause this explosion in her body. That's Pasuk and That's the first one. The second one is, um, sorry, I just lost my place. Nitma. Okay, the second one is, Avar, in the beginning of the section, in Pasuk Yudalit, it starts describing what is a sota. It's a case where he has a Ruach Kina, he's jealous of her. We explain that in a bunch of different ways. And she was defiled, or or she wasn't defiled. We'll get back to that pasuk in a minute. But right now, we're just focusing on the word nitma'a in the beginning of that verse. She was defiled, which means obviously she slept with this man. She was guilty. And the third mention is in at the end, in verse 29. We've seen this pasuk already a whole bunch of times. And she was defiled. So why does it appear in these three locations? Lama, or not really locations, but why does it appear three times in general? Echad laba'al, 
One is to say she's forbidden to her husband. Once, right, the stira happens, she becomes forbidden to her husband. The second is she's forbidden to the person she was suspected of committing adultery with, right? And even before we find that she's guilty, she's already forbidden to him. The truma. And the third is to teach some other halacha, which is once she's suspected of being a sota, she already can't eat truma. So if she's married to a coin, for example, she can no longer eat truma because she's suspected of having cheated on her husband. Divrei Rabbi Akiva. This is all Rabbi Akiva. There's a bit of a problem here because the Baal and the Baal and the fact that she's forbidden to both of them, we already said Rabbi Akiva learns from the fact that it has a Vav. And this bright, it doesn't seem to say that. This bright, it seems to say it's written three times. You can see this some lack of clarity about Rabbi Akiva, exactly what he says. But anyway, this bright to hold, these three places come teach the, these three things. The next line is going to make absolutely no sense. So if I start to read it and you say, what on earth is he talking about? Don't worry, the Gemara is going to say the same thing. Amar Rabbi Ishmael. Why are you learning this from a pasuk? It's a kavachomer. What's the kavachomer? Uma grusha. Let's take a regular divorcee. What do we know about a divorcee? She's, let's say she's the daughter of a Kohen. And she gets divorced. So what does she do? If you remember, a woman who gets divorced or widowed, she goes back to her family's house. Being or let's say she's divorced and then marries, right? Uh, no, so the, okay, let's say that. Let's just go with that. Uma grusha shemuteret litruma. A divorcee is allowed to eat truma. So if you're a bak coin, married to a coin, and you get divorced, you're allowed to eat truma. Meaning, the act of divorce does not disqualify you from eating truma. Okay? And yet, the act of getting divorced forbids you to a Kohen. This is not the part that doesn't make sense yet. Okay? So far, we're saying facts that make sense, which is a woman who's divorced doesn't preclude her from eating truma. Okay? Let's say she's a Bach Kohen. She can go back to her father's house and eat truma. I Meaning it doesn't disqualify her in any way for that, but it does disqualify her from marrying a Kohen. So what's the kavachomer? He says, Zosha asura truma, so one who is forbidden in truma, for example, our sota woman, who is now disqualified from eating truma, enodin shasura would it not be obvious from a kavachomer that she can't marry a kohen? Now, what are we talking about exactly? What do we mean she can't marry a kohen? Who said, you know, uh, Rabbi Ishmael is reacting to Rabbi Akiva, and he's saying, you don't need a pasuk to teach what? You don't need a pasuk to teach this because you can learn it from a kavachomer. What is this? You don't need a pasuk to teach you that she's forbidden to marry a Kohen because you can learn it from a kavachomer. Now go back to Rabbi Akiva. Did he say anything about she's forbidden to marry a Kohen? No. So Rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael is saying you don't need a drasha to teach this because you can learn it from a kavachomer. Rabbi Akiva never said he learned it from a drasha. So something here doesn't jive. Okay, we'll get back to it. Second thing Rabbi Ishmael says, and I'll call this 2A because we're going to have 2A and 2B. It basically has three statements, but the second one, the third one is going to be connected to number two. Listen. Now he goes off in a different tradition. So I read you this pasuk before, which said basically in the beginning of the Sota section, it says, right, he's jealous of his wife and either she was guilty or she wasn't guilty. So why do you have to give both those options and spell them out like that? Either she's guilty or she's not guilty. And the following, he says, in lama shota. In other words, it, it seems to be saying he's jealous of her and she's guilty, or he's jealous of her and she's not guilty. So if she's guilty, lama shota. In other words, it sounds like almost it's describing two different situations. There's a man who's jealous of his wife and she is guilty, and there's a man who's jealous of his wife and she isn't guilty. Well, if she's guilty, she doesn't need a drink because we know she's guilty. And in lonitma, if we know she's not guilty, lama mashket. Why does he ever drink? So what does he learn from here? Magid l'cha patu shasafek asura. Must be coming to add something new because it says both sides. Clearly we're talking about, we don't know which is the truth. Is she guilty? Is she not guilty? And it's coming to teach you something additional. The fact that they're spelling all this out is to teach you that once she goes into that room alone with the man, again, this is something we already know, but this is where he's learning it from. She's forbidden to her husband. Okay, she becomes forbidden to her husband because of, right, at this doubt, she's forbidden. Now, here comes the second part of the second statement. Now we're going to jump to something else, and we're going to get to a halacha that we've seen many times already. And I kept telling you, when we get to Sota, we're going to see this inside, which is we're going to learn from laws of Sota to laws of impurity, like Sheretz impurity, okay? Or it could be any kind of impurity. 
um, like well, there's there's this issue that the word used for her is nitma, which literally means she's impure. What it really means, like a better definition, is she was defiled, right? Or she defiled herself. You know, she did something wrong. But just like, by the way, kosher animals and non-kosher animals, they call them tamay and not tamay, right? It's a term that's used loosely. But because it's talking about tum'ah and purity, uses that word, they're going to learn from here to a sheretz. Okay? Sheretz is one of the creepy crawly creatures that the eight shretzim, that when they're dead, they carry impurity. So now, let's say, right, it goes into a, a, a kli. We just saw this. A vessel, right? It makes the vessel impure. The vessel can then carry on impurity to food, et cetera. So now they say the following. From here, you can learn to a shame. And he's going to make another kavachomer. Shemal seems to be making a lot of these kavachomers. We can learn from here to a shame. So the sota, what do we learn here about the sota? We don't know what she did wrong. And yet she's forbidden to her husband. This is what we call safek, right? We're going to forbid. So, if a woman accidentally slept with this man, she's actually not guilty. She's only a sota if it was intentional. Let's say it was ones. Okay? If it was ones, like he raped her, she's not forbidden to her husband. We learned that from the words, Vihilo needs pasa. Remember, she wasn't raped. That's when she's going to be a sota. If she was raped, she's not a sota. So, sota is a lighter halacha. It's less strict because why? It has to be with intent, right? And it has to be without force. It wasn't that she was forced to do it. So, and yet, despite that it has all these leniencies, that if it was, you know, by the way, what's shogeg? Shogeg is accidental. What could it be accidental? She thought it was her husband in bed. Okay, it was dark. She thought it was her husband. Again, it's hard to imagine this, but she ends up having relations with some other man. Okay, thinking it was her husband. That would be shogeg. Onus would be obviously rape. She's not liable in that case. She wouldn't drink the soda waters. And yet, even though it has those leniencies, it has this big stringency, which is, even though we don't really know if she slept with this guy, we're going to immediately forbid her to her husband and to the person that she's, you know, suspected of being with. So a sheret, now a creepy crawler creature, falls into a bowl, all right, a dish, okay, or falls onto a person without my intent. And let's say you come and you you hold this creepy crawler animal and say, I'm going to touch you with this. And I say, no, 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 don't get it anywhere near me. And you do, touches me, I'm impure. It doesn't matter. So now we're going to say a sheretz is more strict than the sota because of this. It doesn't matter how the sheretz touched it, whether there was intent or not intent. So therefore it's strict in that way. And here's how a classic kabachama works. If the lenient one has the strict halacha, then the strict one is obviously going to have the strict halacha. So obviously, moving out of Amubet, a sefek should be like a vada. Okay, and basically, if you have some question, did the sheretz touch me? Did the sheretz touch this vessel? We go strictly. We rule strictly. However, here comes the big thing. And this is what we've seen many, many times in the Gemara. Umimakom Shabbat. But since we're learning the whole laws of sefek tuma is going to be impure from the sota, it can only be if it has the same criteria as the sota has, which is what? One we've seen many times, the other one we really haven't seen too much. Masota this is the one that always comes up. The sota, we don't know what happened, but what, wh where did it transpire, this thing that we don't know what happened? When she was alone in a room with a man. That was in a private domain. It didn't happen in public. If it happened in public, there would be no doubt about it. Therefore, when a sheret touched something and it happened in a private domain, we're going to rule strictly. But if it happened in a public domain, whereas the sota happened in a public domain, we wouldn't have any doubt here. We wouldn't be strict because we know what happened. So therefore, suffix tuma in a public domain, you're not sure if, if you walked over a dead body, we're going to lean, we're going to rule leniently. Okay. Umas or a sheret, let's say. Umasota, another criteria. Davar sheyesh bodat lishael. This is a very interesting criteria. Somebody knows the truth. You can ask the woman. Now, we might not believe her, but there is someone who knows exactly what happened in that room, the man and the woman, right? This is something that could theoretically, there's different kinds of doubts in the world. There's doubts that theoretically could be found out. And there's doubts that you could have no idea about, okay? You just don't know whether it happened or not, right? 
the, you walk into a room and there's a sheret and there's a vessel and they're near each other and you don't know, did they come in contact with each other, right? Did the sheret, you know, as it was dying, fall on the vessel and then drop from there to the floor and it's on the floor right next to it. You know, maybe it dropped on the way or I don't know what kind of doubt, but you could have a doubt where nobody knew about. So af sheretz, you're only going to be strict about a sheretz if it's deval sheyesh bodat yishael. If somebody was in the room, they might not know, but theoretically they could have known. Obviously, if somebody knew, then we would know, we would ask them. But it's a case where someone theoretically could have known, but they just can't answer us about it. You know, whether we don't know why they can't answer, but they can't answer, maybe they didn't see exactly, but they were there to have been able to see. There had to have been humans there, basically. So therefore, Mikanabru, here's just the summary, and this is very easy, this part. Right, so we're now going to do talk about two things. If somebody could have been there and known about it, then we're going to differentiate. If it's because you need both criteria. So once you have one, you also have to have the other. So it's going to split. If it was in a public domain, you're not going to be impure. If it's in a private domain, you're going to be impure. So if there's some sort of doubt about whether the sherets touch something, we're going to rule strictly as long as someone could have known about it and it's in a private domain. But if it doesn't have criteria number one, then obviously criteria number two is irrelevant. No matter what, we're going to be uh, we're going to be lenient. It doesn't matter whether it's public, private, it's going to be pure. So those are rules of tuma, suffix tuma, which are learned out from the soto, which is a suffix as well. Now we're going to just ask our questions. And with this we'll end, we have two questions on this bright. Number one, Rabbi Ishmael doesn't make any sense, as we said before. I'm a Rabbi Akiva, Truma, Umahadu, Le'ihu, Kahuna. Rabbi Akiva was talking about Truma, and he said there's no need to learn Kahuna, but Rabbi Akiva didn't talk about Kahuna. The two, and additionally, Rabbi Akiva didn't mention Kahuna, that she's forbidden to a coin. So now we're going to say the Rabbi Akiva, Kahuna, Manale. Where does Rabbi Akiva himself learn the laws that she's forbidden to a coin? Because he already said three dress showed, and he didn't include the, the fact that she's forbidden to a coin. The Chite Makuna Lot Sri Chakran, if you're going to say, and I'm going to leave you my mash mid sentence. If you're going to say Kuna doesn't need a Pasuk, maybe because of Rabbi Ishmael's Kabachomer, well, we're going to reject that and explain why he thinks that Kuna would need a Pasuk. So we're left with, we started with two questions on this bright time. Number one, Rabbi Ishmael makes no sense. He's responding to something that Rabbi Kiva actually didn't say. And number two, where would Rabbi, where would Rabbi Kiva actually learn that a woman who suspected Sota can't marry a Kohen? Okay, so again, the first part of the daf I already reviewed. This part of the daf was this bright which had Rabbi Akiva darshaning these three nitma'az, which one to forbid her to the husband, one to forbid her to the adulterer, and one to forbid her to eat truma. Rabbi Yishmael seems to think that Rabbi Akiva included forbid to marry coin and said, you don't need a drasha for that. You need, right, you can learn it from a simple kapa homer. explains his kapa homer. Then he brings another kapa homer. Basically, first he starts off with the, um, the fact that we learned that a suffix sota is forbidden. He learns that from imnitma, lo nitma, that she's forbidden to her husband. Once we say that she's forbidden to her husband, we learn from there, a kava homer to a sherens. And when it comes to impurity, suffix in the public domain, we're going to be lenient. Suffix in the private domain, we're going to be strict, only though if it's something where there was a human involved that could have theoretically known, even though he doesn't or she doesn't know. And with that, we'll finish our daf, wishing everybody hagas ma'ut sameh and as people say. Have a great day, everyone. We're celebrating wherever you are in the world. I said yesterday, it's one of these holidays that you feel much more strongly when you're in Israel. It's harder outside of Israel, but I hope that you all manage to find ways to celebrate this important day. Have a great day.